Sophie Scholl was the, I think, the youngest member of a student group in in Munich of uh, of um, that was led by a professor that were doing nonviolent but very insistent resistance through the dis distribution of pamphlets and meetings in secret uh, against the Third Reich, um, and then uh, were eventually um, found out and um, immediately executed, uh, including uh, Sophie's brother Hans. And uh, uh, and the um, the this piece uh, features both writings from her letters, that is, um, the letters of of Sophie, but also uh, two excerpts from the pamphlets that were distributed. Why did you, in particular, decide to adopt Sophocles' Antigone as this dramatic framework? What about that story spoke to you? Yeah. So rather than write an entire you know, libretto or something myself, it seems like this was a good structure for um, uh, interpolating some of Sophie's writings. Uh, Antigone is, it's kind of an obvious um, example of uh, Antigone finds uh, her, um, her brother is died and not given a proper burial after this war. Uh, she decides that she's going to bury him herself, which is against uh, the dictates of the state that has triumphed in that particular war. And so she's um, eventually sentenced to death for doing so. So, and and the the common or the the, the sort of like surface reading of that play generally, the Sophocles play, is that uh, Antigone wants to do something that's naturally right, that's naturally good. You know that she she knows that this is wrong. She needs to give her brother a proper burial against the sort of idea of a of a of a a good that comes from the state or, or law or something that is sort of more abstracted um, for a community. And so it's that the conflict of natural and state law um, that is that is pretty uh, commonly uh, applied to Antigone, but it's a little bit more subtle. I know that when we did the, the, the performance at Bucknell, um, one of the uh, Greek scholars mentioned, um, and it's very interesting that there's a lot of um, ambiguity in the whole story. In fact, Ismene is sort of seen as the stoic intermediary that maybe is really the ideal for, for Greeks at the time that she, uh, you know, doesn't, she washes her hands of it, even though it really um, bothers her. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's sort of, I think, at least for modern, you know, modern listeners, we see this as Antigone needs to do this thing that's right, and she's executed for it by a, by a government. Mm -hmm. I think something, James, that you said when we were doing interviews about this uh, several months back when we were recording it, and uh, one of one of the quotes James says, it's a story about doing the right thing when the government's doing the wrong thing. And that's a very simple way of, of talking about, and, and, but also a very profound way of sort of defining both of these stories and the way that James interweaves them in the libretto. You almost can't decipher when you're hearing the voice of Antigone or you're hearing the voice of Sophie or, or the White Rose Movement. And to see that par parallel between this very ancient story that has symbolism for a certain culture in a certain time, but to see that carried over into this 20th century story. And then to hear these words in the 21st century when they have new import and new meaning, new import and new meaning uh, for our modern living audience. Uh, I think there's, you know, there are words in this that in June 2022 mean a lot to me. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's important for commissioning, it's important for recording, it's important for live performance, you know, when we're creating new things, that we're creating things that not only reflect history, but also hopefully shape a current culture or a future culture. And, and it's not simple. I mean, I think when you listen to this story of Sophie Scholl, we'd all like to think that we would um, do what she would do. We'd all like to think that we would do what Antigone did. And yet, you know, Christina English, who sings Ismene in, in only one movement, it's a, it's a really striking solo movement. Um, really, that's, that's a stance that many of us would take. Um, to understand what is right, but to do the thing that will keep me alive, right? And so it's almost an inhuman bravery that both Antigone and Sophie exhibit that can be hard 
hard to even to relate to how you how you could be that sure. Um, and there's one uh, there's also one statement, you know, in in one of the pamph pamphlets that James quotes, "Who could be sure that the world would not perish if one star was missing from the sky?" You know, it, there's so much that we sort of take for granted, whether that's an individual person's contribution or an individual person's action, be it good or um, or evil <laughs> or something more descript between those two things, you know, as humans, it's, it's hard to be sure. And yet these two young women and young women, younger than Lorelai, were sure that they were doing the right thing. And I think that's, you know, when I've performed this with young people at Bucknell, at Harvard, um, and hopefully with my students at Peabody, they relate to this story and they feel an immediacy of it, even though it precedes them by, you know, well, it precedes them in many centuries, not just these two stories. Having the chance to kind of create a Greek chorus <laughs> with the texts at hand and in, in your, uh, for you, James, and in your case, Beth, having a chance to sort of bring to life in music a, a Greek chorus <laughs> uh, with your ensemble could have been quite, uh, quite interesting experiences for you. Yeah, I, um, I've, I've always liked Greek drama. So it was really, it was very interesting to me and intriguing to set Greek choruses. It seems like whenever I do these, you know, I'm usually doing something with um, large texts, you know, or dramatic things. Um, and I'm usually trying, I'm usually juxtaposing something that's old with something that's new. And there's, it seems like there's always this moment that makes the, the that unlocks the key to the libretto, right? And, and in this case, it was realizing that rather than, even though I love Greek choruses, rather than using Sophocles all the time, that I was like, oh, I can use the pamphlets. They're Greek, they are Greek choruses. They're, they're you know, they're, they're the, the, the purest sense of something that is like a Greek chorus. So that, that's what really sort of was the aha moment for me. Um, and that, and in, in this case, um, there, each of the Greek choruses is set in a, in a slightly different sort of faux genre in my own style. So one is sort of like Gregorian chant, one is very sort of serialist, modern atonal, one is more Renaissance-like and one is kind of romantic. And, um, and uh, so the idea that there's sort of this timeless telling of, 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 of a, a chorus that's always behind the scenes saying things. It's also, it's also very intriguing to just imagine, right? That, that in these plays, these were performed. They weren't just read, you know, they were, there's probably music. We don't know exactly how they were done, but uh, it's, it's a beautiful spectacle to try to imagine. Yeah, and I, it's and it's also not unlike uh, the chorales and a passion. Um, both of these being, you know, these performers or a subset of the performers that um, kind of turn from the drama out to the audience to say this is this is what we're talking about today. You know, it's it's the it's the people performing speaking, right? It's not the characters speaking. And I think, of course, these words are not. Um, of these choruses are not Lorelai's words, but I think they are words that we were able to, you know, embody collectively. They feel like collective words. They don't feel like one character's words. It's calling for, for action or for others to reflect. <laughs> <laughs> 